Hello Internet, Seth Skorakowski, and today we'll be exploring the Call of Cthulhu adventure Egg Out of Time. Written by Ben Burns and published by New Comet Games, the scenario appears in 2020's collection A Time for Sacrifice, which is five adventures set around Maya culture, ruins, and cities throughout the Yucatan, Central Mexico, and as far south as Honduras, uh, set between 1925 and 1931. The scenarios can be played individually or as a campaign, and Egg Out of Time is the first of those adventures. One feature that the adventures have is translating Mayan writing. So to simulate this, the book gives us a simplified set of language tables so players can try to decipher portions themselves, adding to the immersion of trying to translate some of the artifacts in the various adventures. Of course, game masters could simply have all this done just by rolling skill checks instead, but I think it's kind of a neat option to let the players try to figure out what all these engravings might mean. Egg Out of Time is the first scenario in the collection, and it's pretty short. The whole thing is just under 30 pages, and then once you remove all the maps and the handouts, the adventure itself is really just about 18 pages. Now, I didn't run this adventure myself. I did this one as a player, my podcast partner, Sean Hook, serving as our keeper, and it was with a few of our patrons in the Modern Mythos podcast, and those episodes are available to listen to, or at least the first few are available to listen to, the rest are still being released, and I have a link down in the video description below. However, once we had completed it, I was able to open up the module and look at it, and while I knew that there were some areas that uh, John had changed, I discovered one piece that we had not uncovered when we played through this adventure, or that uh, John had not decided not to include at all, so that really changed my perception of the plot, and I really wish we had discovered this information during the course of the adventure itself when we were playing it. Now, the scenario was set in 1925, with all the investigators working at an archaeological dig in the Yucatan. The PCs can be students, archaeology professors, soldiers hired as bodyguards, you know, doctors, nurses, wealthy donors, you know, whatever they like, as long as it fits with whatever the scenario is. So what about you? What did you play when you did this adventure? More importantly, did you survive it? I played a lawyer who specialized in accounting and archaeology, uh, so he was maintaining the budget of the whole expedition, as well as handling any of the legal hurdles that they might encounter along the way, as, you know, as far as different laws in the area, or you know, the exporting of any of the stuff that they find. But as far as his ultimate survival, I'll let listeners discover that. I get it. Find out if Seth Skorkowski survived on the Modern Mythos podcast. Nice little marketing hook there. Though, because you have never survived a single adventure that John Hook has run you through, I got five bucks that says you didn't. Now, while the adventure was written for regular 7th edition Call of Cthulhu, I feel this works just as well, if not a little bit better, with Pulp Cthulhu. This thing is pretty pulpy as is, so it really wouldn't require changing all that much, and we had a lot of fun playing the scenario. However, there are some areas that keepers might want to look out for, so what I'm going to do is offer my tips, my suggestions, and my criticisms for this adventure. And I check the NPC. I'm mostly here just to bust Seth's chops and recreate some of the more memorable moments from this adventure. But before we go any further, I must warn you that there will be spoilers. So any players in the audience, please stop here. Send your game masters this way to see about running Egg Out of Time for you. But if you keep going and you spoil yourself, you'll be sacrificed to Toe Hill. Okay, Game Masters, let's get this thing started. As I said, the adventure takes place in 1925, and the player characters are part of a university dig at Chichen Itza, which I apologize, I am probably most likely butchering that pronunciation. The dig has been going on for several years now. Currently, a Dr. James has been given the funding to clear one of the smaller buildings near the pyramid where he believes the Mayan god Tohil was supposed to be buried. Now, Tohil was a real Mayan god of fire and war, known for his insatiable thirst for blood led sacrifices. The scenario opens as Dr. James is working alone and discovers a secret door. Unfortunately, he also triggers a poison gas trap, so summoned by his cry, the player characters rush to his aid in time to see a stone door sliding close as Dr. James lies on the ground unresponsive. I suggest adding a, a, something like a good spot hidden roll here. You might be able to see a yellowing cloud, like a little puff dissipating in the air. Maybe a good medicine roll might be able to see a, a fine little yellow powder around a, Dr. James's eye and nostrils. Holy crap, guys, Dr. James is down. It looks like he might be dying. Though he also seems to have discovered a secret door right over there. So do we take him to the hospital now and then come all the way back here and then check out that secret door? Because that is going to take us hours going back and forth. Or maybe we could just take some grad students to take him off to the hospital and we could raid this son of a bitch right now. 
Now, the module is fine with either driving Dr. James the two hours to the hospital in Merida or having the NPCs do that for them while they stay at Chichen Itza. However, it works best if they do not split up here. So if it's looking like the player characters are planning on splitting up and, you know, half of them going off to the hospital and half of them staying there, I recommend speeding up when the message arrives. That way it arrives while everybody is still in the same place. Now, one thing that I didn't understand when I was playing this adventure is just how large the city of Merida is. It's not huge, but it's a good-sized city with a hospital and a university. Here's a map and a photograph from 1920 and 25 that I found on Wikipedia. So keepers, I suggest that you describe this place as about being the same size as Arkham, Massachusetts. And it's got quite a bit of good information that could be found in the library, and that's really the only place that any sort of research can be done. And I also suggest that keepers cut out and use these pieces of information that they uh, learn as the handouts that they can give their players. Either after reaching the hospital or if the player characters all elected to stay at the dig site, a man named Jose arrives with an urgent message for Dr. James. And it comes from a Dr. Koran who says that his dig site at Kaaba has been attacked by armed natives and he's begging Dr. James for help. Holy crap, guys, this letter from Dr. Koran says that most of his expedition has been murdered. And get this, some of the natives are trying to resurrect their ancient and dead god, which is crazy because we all know that magic ain't a real thing. We have got to get there, we have got to rescue Dr. Koran, and we got to put a stop to this. Hold on, Dr. Koran, we're coming to save you! After a few hours' drive, the investigators arrive at Kaaba. Dr. Koran meets them outside the village, and bodies litter the ground, and some chanting comes from one of the buildings. Dr. Koran insists that they need to attack now, before that ceremony completes, and there's a few light rifles that are lying around. Now, for our game, we also went ahead and grabbed some dynamite that the archaeologists have been using. We managed to find some of that in one of the tents on site. Inside the building, several men dance and chant around a large glowing egg that's floating in the air. Now this scene can play out several different ways, and I like that the module accounts for this, offering several different suggestions just depending on what the player characters might do. Now what the player characters don't know, and that we never found out when we actually played this, is the natives aren't trying to hatch the egg, but reseal it back down inside the well. However, two of the armed natives do want that egg to hatch, so their god can cast out these foreign invaders. So while well, several things could happen during the course of this encounter, counter here, one thing that is going to happen regardless is the egg hatches, releasing an infant flying polyp. It kills Dr. Koran if he's still alive at this point, sucking out his brain and then escapes. One of the dying natives tells the player characters that their involvement has now doomed everybody, and he asks them to seek the elder back in his village nearby so the player characters can learn how to stop this thing. Wait, so Dr. Koran was the one that was trying to awaken this monster, and the natives, save for two jooks, were the ones that were trying to keep this egg from hatching? Huh. So is Dr. Koran just going to sacrifice us to this monster if we succeed it? Exactly. Now, either on his person or back in his tent is a lengthy journal explaining what happened. I'm kind of torn about this handout. It's a great story, but seven pages is an enormous handout. So I don't know if that we just simply didn't find this when we played it, or if our keeper decided not to include it. But learning how Dr. Koran was the bad guy and how he became corrupted really changed my perception of the plot of this adventure. In the short of it is, is that after he discovered the egg, he started having visions of a future, which included the Second World War, and believing some of the things that he or some of the things that he discovered in a book back in the university library, uh, he was able to uh, move this egg around with some sort of crystal device, and he figured that he might be able to control this monster, and together they could prevent the Second World War. And I really dug how this was a noble intention behind his actions here, and some terrible things that he did trying to uh, in order to have this happen, but he really thought thought that he was a good guy. And I like that idea of that's how the corruption works. It's not that he wanted to destroy the world or gain ultimate power. He ultimately wanted to stop a huge war before it could happen. Visiting the village, the investigators meet with an elder who, through a very lengthy story, explains how centuries ago a horrible monster ravaged the countryside here. The Mayans were powerless against this thing, but then the god Tohil arrived with his magic spear. And Tohil slew the beast, but the beast had laid an egg before it died. 
Tohill demanded many bloody sacrifices to gather his strength to destroy this egg, but just wasn't able to. So finally Tohill buried the egg in a deep pit and returned to his home in Chichen Itza, telling the Mayans to awaken him if this egg ever hatched. Now when the archaeologists discovered the egg, they then you know, the natives tried to bury it again, but between the player characters and the faction who wants this monster to awaken, they failed. So he tells the player characters the only way to stop this monster is for them to return to Chichen Itza and awaken Tohill. Oh, well, conveniently enough, we just happened to have discovered Tohill's tomb this morning. No, oh, our boss is probably dying in a hospital somewhere due to some horrible trap when he opened the door, but that's okay. We will get to that tomb, resurrect your god, and take care of that monster. Don't worry about a thing. Returning all the way to Chichen Itza, the player characters can inspect the secret door that jo Dr. James had found at the beginning to discover carved writing in the frame. Now using the neat translation tables in the book, they can safely open this door. Inside they encounter another thing that needs translating, this time a puzzle that they have to complete before they're devoured by flesh-eating beetles, reminiscent of the Brendan Fraser mummy movie, a personal favorite of mine. Now once they've completed that, they enter Toehill's tomb. Now one thing that John Hook changed here, and I absolutely love this, and I strongly recommend that other keepers do this as well, is instead of it just being a stone room with some weird sci-fi stuff that's inside of it, have the passageway beyond this be, you know, just glowing white, like something out of a space odyssey movie as the player characters uh, enter this time machine spaceship that's inside this building. Oh yeah, that sudden change from ancient and dusty stone to clean, futuristic white light is the last thing your players are going to expect. and. They're not going to soon forget. Now inside of here is a glass sarcophagus, and after fiddling with some buttons, a hologram appears to deliver a staggeringly long monologue. Oh my god, this thing is huge. Now the short of this is, is that Captain Tom Tohill of the 25th century was contacted by the great race of Yith to stop a flying polyp that was ravaging ninth, uh, the 9th century Mayans. The Yithians gave Captain Tohill the technology to defeat this monster, a special helmet to see it as well as a plasma spear to kill it. As as well as the technology for him to travel back in time. However, after he killed the polyp, he discovered that he had laid an egg, but due to this egg's ability to phase in and out of the physical realm, he was unable to destroy it. He also discovered that the Yithians, in order to preserve the timeline, gave him some sort of wasting disease, and Captain Tohill managed to continue surviving through blood transfusions, but it required so many transfusions and so often, and it started becoming more and more frequent that they had to have him, that the Mayans were dying in droves just to give him enough blood to stay alive. So eventually he just hid the egg, he returned to his ship, and he instructed the natives to wake him if this beast hatched. Unfortunately, when the player characters learn all this, they also discover that in the centuries since this took place, the suspended animation chamber has broken down and Captain Towhill is just a mummified corpse. Additionally, the helmet and the spear that, were, uh, that he had were coded to Towhill's specific DNA and cannot work with anyone except for Captain Towhill. Okay, so the Mayan god Tohill was really just this dude from the future and needed a lot of blood. However, he is most definitely as dead as my love life is right now. However, his high-tech spear and other gizmos that he was going to use to slay that monster were only going to work with him and they can't work with us. That is not good. Though, we did get an antidote for Dr. James's poisoning, so it wasn't a total loss. Now there are two different spells that could work to solve this problem here. Uh, the first one is Join Vessel, which the player characters will learn of if they bring that antidote that they got back to Dr. James in the hospital, uh, they give it to him, he awakens, and he tells them that he knows about this spell that could work, but he doesn't know where the player characters could even find it. The other spell is Raise Dead, which the player characters will learn of if they go back to the village elder, and while they're there, if they ask him about Join Vessel, uh, uh, he'll say, oh yeah, yeah, I went down will work too, and both of those spells can be found at the House of Turtles in Usmal. Now Usmal, or Uxmal, I'm not entirely sure how you pronounce that because I've seen both ways described as the correct pronunciation, is still being excavated at this time, and we have signs of attempted looting that's been going on here. Now one thing that all of these Maya cities have is these are all very real places, and you can find a lot of great pictures of them if you just search online, and that can really help describe the size and the scope of these sites. Now inside the tomb we have some puzzles including more Maya writing to translate, lots of treasure to be found, however this is also a 
very pulpy scene with fighting skeletons and a mummy, and one of the reasons that I feel this adventure would be more suited for Pulp Cthulhu than it is for Call of Cthulhu. Now, for our game when we played this, John decided that the Tomb's Undead just really didn't fit with the theme and the mood of the rest of the adventure, so he completely rewrote Uxmal to better fit with the rest of the adventure. And he gave me his keeper notes and maps and handouts to share with you guys, so I'll stick a link at the, in the description below for John Hook's version of this too. Now inside the investigators we'll find one or both spells. Now here is where we also had a problem. The spells are handouts that are written in the Maya script and the characters that you know, we've been translating everything of the adventures so far so we naturally just started translating what these things said. However, you know, first off these are very long and this took us a very long time of scouring the tables for all the symbols and figuring out what each one meant and that completely halted the game's momentum right there. Second, after deciphering these two messages about you know, two flints and blood and the flame, we had no idea what these things were even talking about. It was just kind of like gobbledygook and we thought we were going to have to figure out what it was trying to tell us. Now, the previous and far shorter translations that we had made, those were something that we had to decipher the meaning from those, but we couldn't make heads or tails of what these were trying to tell us, these spells, and that really added to the frustration after spending so much time trying to translate them. But the truth is that it doesn't actually matter what those things say. The players do not need to translate these at all. Uh, what they're supposed to do is then take these spells, take them back to the village elder so he can tell them what to do and what they are. So keepers, I don't recommend giving your players these handouts because your players are going to naturally going to try to translate them and it's only going to lead to a lot of lost time and a lot of frustration because it doesn't exactly say what the spells are or what they do. Simply describe the spells to them, verify that they have the correct labels that the village elder told them to look out for and just move on with the adventure. Once they've gotten the scrolls, the adventure is going to quickly escalate. The player characters are going to be attacked by some of the zealots who believe that this monster is going to chase away the foreign invaders and, you know, let them have their land back. And the player characters, once they get to the village and talk to the elder, they're going to discover that the polyp has destroyed it and most of the people are now dead and the monster now knows that they're planning on raising Captain Towhill because it's able to suck out people's brains. And so it's going to try to attack them during the ceremony because either spell is going to take uh, 10 rounds and it's going to attack them, I think, around the seventh round. Now, if the player characters have both spells, if they did everything and they're able to get both of them, they just need to choose which one of these they're going to use. Join Vessel gives one of the player characters the correct DNA and the knowledge of how to use the spear and the helmet. Raise Dead requires that one of the player characters willingly sacrifice themselves to raise Towhill for just 24 hours. Whoa, whoa, whoa. One of us has to die in order for him to survive? Why us? Wasn't there some survivors back in that village of people who were all willing to sacrifice their lives for Towhill's name? Maybe we could accommodate one of them for that. After that's pretty much just a straight fight with a monster. Some of the other player characters can get involved here if they rebuilt some weird science device by gathering some crystals and being able to use that against it in order to buy themselves more time. Now once the flying polyp is dead, the adventure is done. Now the player characters, they're still going to have Captain Towhill's 25th century technology, even though it won't work for them after either of the spells wear off, which both of them last 24 hours. But, you know, who knows what they're going to do with them, right? I mean, these things are probably going to be pretty valuable. Valuable. And I feel that might change the course of human history if they uh, reveal that they have this stuff. So maybe Towhill, before he, he dies, if they resurrected him, he takes all that stuff back to his ship and then travels off into the ether of time somewhere. Maybe the character who joined with them, there's enough Towhill knowledge inside of him that he knows that these items cannot you know, get out there. You know, there needs to be hidden away. Or maybe the, the great race of Yith will take measures to collect them. So he has to take all the stuff and take it away in order to save everybody else because otherwise the, the great race might do something drastic. Or maybe you could have a couple body swapped Yithians come pulling up right as the smoke clears like the men in black. You know, they could confiscate the spear and magic helmet, whatever other technology that the player characters have, and then, you know, maybe bribe a threat and then player characters into not saying a word about any of that. Overall, my feelings are pretty mixed on this adventure. I love the fact that the scenario was set in Central America and weaves in the mythos with Mayan mythology. I think that's awesome. And I dig the fact that this egg has seduced this, driven this doctor insane with promises of trying to save the world from war. I really dig that part. And I love the translation portions, or at least the short translation portions. The 
long translations with the scrolls, that's a completely different matter entirely. The adventure has a lot of running back and forth, hours upon hours of driving from one site to another and then back again, and keepers might want to show how much time this takes by having the player characters need to stop and sleep or they start suffering penalties because they're so exhausted. Uh, we have two time limits in this adventure. Dr. James's poisoning will kill him in two days, and the monster reaches full strength in one week. So, keepers, I suggest that you lean into those timelines, you know, those ticking time clock aspects, you know, have that ticking time clock be something that they have to work against, you know, have risk them running out of gas while they're going back and forth through the jungles. And it's not unreasonable to say that those rough dirt roads of 1925 and those old vehicles, you know, you're only getting about eight to ten miles per gallon there, and a Model T and our Model T trucks also had ten gallon tanks, so they're going to need five gallon gas cans, you know, because they're probably not going to be that many places that they can stop and get fuel out in the jungle, and it's not like gas stations at the time were only 24 hours, so if they aren't able to get back to the city at a good time, they might have to wait the next day in order to purchase more fuel. Or you could have something happen to their gas cans, like maybe they, they get shot by these zealots that are trying to stop the PCs. Or maybe a failed drive auto check could mean that that's just time that the player characters lose with an overheated engine or getting stuck in the mud somewhere. You know, it adds to that tension of that, that ticking time clock of we've only got two days in order to save Dr. James, or we've only got one week to stop this monster before it becomes too powerful. And I feel that the final trip back to the village elder outside of Kaaba isn't necessary once they've gotten everything out of Uxmal. You could have it where the player characters, they just roll to translate the spells and they know what they mean. Or maybe you could have the spells not be scrolls that they have to, to read and translate, but something more like an artifact that they use. Like the raised dead one, they could be an obsidian knife that used to sacrifice one person and they smear their blood on the person uh, that you're trying to raise, and that brings them back to life. In the joined vessel spell, you can make it where it's like some sort of a bowl or cup, and you you know you you do it has all this writing on the inside of it, and you mix some of your blood with part of the person that's dead, and then you drink that concoction, and that causes the spell to take effect. I also suggest that keepers really lean into this faction of radicals who want the flying polyp to mature because they've been led to believe that it's going to help them. Right? So you could have not just that one ambush that takes place outside of Uxmal, but you could have a lot more than that. You know, maybe they could come riding out of the jungle on horses and give chase to the player characters as they're traveling between different locations, or maybe when the player characters go inside one of the tombs, or they stop at a hotel, or they stop at the library, they could sabotage the player character's car, right? Well, pour some sugar in the gas tank or something. Um, or the player characters, if they, they stop somewhere and they get some food, one of the zealots could kind of sneak up and put a little poison on their food at some restaurant, or maybe just the food that they have back in their car. Not enough necessarily to kill the player characters if they're poisoned, but just enough to delay them. And then once the flying polyp it reaches its full power, the polyp can kill the player characters for them. You can pick up a time for sacrifice on the new Comet Games website or at Drive Through RPG, links below. It's not a perfect adventure, but it is definitely worth checking out. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more of our stuff, such as game reviews or how-tos, just hit that subscribe button. If you want to support Seth's channel, consider picking up one of his books and novels, available in print and audiobook, and hey, if you enjoy it, you can drop him a review, because he loves that stuff. Till next time, gamers, you have a great day. You know... I think it'd be pretty cool as if one of the player characters did that joint vessel with Major Tom or Captain Tom or whatever the hell his name was, that if a few months later they realize that they have now got that same blood disease and they have to start consuming large amounts of blood in order to stay alive, right? However, because they found all that gold in that one tomb earlier, they are now set up for life. So now they can afford to travel the world and kind of hide and have people bring them blood and bodies to consume. That might make for a pretty cool villain a couple years down the road.